Good afternoon. My name is Philip Munoz. I'm the director of the Constitutional Studies program, and it's uh, my pleasure to uh, welcome you to the uh, first kickoff here at, at Notre Dame. Uh, I'm sure, uh, as everyone knows uh, in this room, uh, questions concerning free speech uh, and academic freedom and its limits have erupted in recent years on our nation's campuses, uh, including at Notre Dame. Uh, given the, the controversial nature uh, and the divisiveness of the issues, the Constitutional Studies program has decided to do what we always do with pressing and explosive political issues. Uh, we bring thoughtful people to campus to talk, to debate, to argue, uh, and try to figure this issue out. Uh, I couldn't be more pleased than uh, to bring today's speaker to Notre Dame as he has recently published an, ex <laughs> published an extraordinarily uh, thoughtful book uh, on the subject. Uh, before I call uh, Nick Marr, one of our Tocqueville fellows, uh, up to the stage to properly introduce our speaker, uh, just a few announcements and, uh, uh, and thank yous. Um, and we have seats up front. Please, those standing in the back, please feel free to come up front or fill in as, as you see. I'm sure we'll be getting more students, so come on up. Uh, today's lecture is part of our uh, Constitutional Studies Initiative on free speech in the university. Uh, the initiative consists of public events like today's lecture. Uh, it also consists of a series of private seminars. Uh, tomorrow, a group of faculty and alumni will gather together here uh, to, to focus on these issues, to talk about them. In a few weeks, we're going to host an undergraduate seminar, uh, believe it or not, on a Friday afternoon and Saturday morning uh, to talk about these issues. Uh, perhaps most importantly, my colleague Matt Hall is teaching a class uh, on free speech this uh, semester. So thank you to Professor Hall. I know he's here somewhere. And to his class for, for joining us uh, today. Uh, the program is able to sponsor all these events in part because of the extraordinary generosity uh, of, our, of our benefactors, uh, some who have who've traveled here to South Bend to be with us today. And I didn't ask them. I hope they don't mind me <laughs> recognizing them. Uh, Ken and Ann Stimson, uh, Tad and Jennifer True. Uh, we have a few other benefactors in the room. So thank you very much. Uh, for, you, for your support and allowing us to, to do programming uh, like this. We have some foundational foundation partners as well, the Jack Miller Foundation, the Bradley Foundation, the Koch Foundation. Um, all of these folks have got behind us and have allowed us to bring folks like uh, our speaker today to, to campus. Uh, we also have a number of distinguished guests uh, here today. Um, we had a seminar this morning on a book manuscript seminar. Uh, we have some of the nation's leading constitutional scholars with us today. Uh, I, won't, I won't point them out, but thank you all who have uh, stayed for, for this event. Uh, we also have a very special uh, Notre Dame alumnus, uh, uh, Judge Tom Hardiman, class of 87, is here with us. So Judge Hardiman, thank you for, for joining us. Um, Judge Hardiman was a uh, PLS major, but uh, that was only because the constitutional studies minor wasn't in existence back then. About the minor, uh, any of you undergraduates who are interested in the minor, we started the Constitutional Studies minor uh, five years ago. It's quickly become one of the biggest in arts and letters. Uh, you don't have to be in arts and letters to, to minor in Constitutional Studies. Um, so if you want to learn more about the minor, please uh, come talk to me after uh, today's talk. Uh, to introduce our speaker is one of our Tocqueville fellows, uh, Nick Marr. Nick is a junior, uh, he's a history major, maybe better known now as a columnist. Uh, and he's one of our undergraduate fellows, and he will introduce our speaker. Nick? Okay. This is Dr. Keith Whittington. He's the William Cromwell Professor of Politics at Princeton University. He's the, leading, the nation's leading scholar on the new originalism, and he's especially well known for his work on constitutional interpretation and the judici judiciary. The author or editor of at least 12 books, he is currently completing two more books, A History of the Judicial Review Acts. Uh, well, they don't teach speaking in history, so. <laughs> Acts of Congress and an examination of the idea of democracy in America from the American Revolution to the Gilded Age. Today, he will be speaking on the themes of his most recent book, Speak Freely, Why Universities Must Defend Free Speech. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Keith Whittington. Thank you. Okay. 
So thank you all for coming out. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time uh, to, to do it. Um, and I think it's an important topic um, to talk about on college campuses and beginning of year is always a good time to um, start thinking about these um, issues um, and set the uh, right tone for the rest of the year. Um, I have to admit this is not an issue that I expected to be uh, writing about and talking about. I set aside some other projects that I'd been working on uh, in order to um, start thinking about this uh, particular topic and to write this book and, and take time to um, try to go out and talk about these issues um, precisely because I think they're so pressing and I think that there are a lot of things that I took for granted um, about how college campuses operated, what people expected about how um, they would continue to operate. Um, that really it didn't make sense to continue to take those things for granted. Instead we see um, ongoing controversies um, on college campuses about the scope of free speech um, on those campuses, on the scope of intellectual inquiry um, on those campuses. Some of those controversies um, arise uh, inside of universities as people disagree among themselves um, about um, uh, what speech ought to look like, what kind of inquiry ought to look like, uh, what kind of teaching and scholarship ought to look like. Um, but sometimes those controversies arise from the outside as outside interests and actors um, uh, criticize those of us who live and work on college campuses uh, for things that we've said in public or things that we do um, on campuses. Um, and I think all those wind up in, uh, posing serious threats um, to whether or not uh, American universities uh, will continue to operate in the future um, the way they have operated um, in the recent past. And so I think it's critically important that we um, collectively uh, think seriously about what it is we want universities to do um, and what that um, uh, implies about how we ought to conduct ourselves on campuses and what we ought to tolerate and engage in um, on college campuses. Um, hopefully, um, and we can find a, a common agreement um, that will lead to um, robust intellectual increase um, on college campuses in the future. Um, as I think we have often um, done in the past. But at the same time, I don't think, think we should um, uh, be too nostalgic um, about the past. There's a tendency to want to think that problems are particularly bad now. Um, certainly for many of those off of college campuses who criticize what they see occurring on college campuses, um, they look at people like you. Um, students on college campuses, um, and they complain that this generation um, is particularly intolerant, this generation is particularly unwilling um, to engage seriously um, with ideas, um, that this is a generation of snowflakes. Um, and I think that's a completely wrong way of thinking about the issues that we're seeing on college campuses um, today. So when I speak um, to student audiences, I think it's important um, to uh, reaffirm for you um, that your experiences and difficulties and challenges are not unique. Um, others have gone through um, similar um, uh, arguments and, and debates uh, in the past. And I also try to emphasize to those off campuses that what they're seeing on campuses now are not unusual. Um, and we shouldn't um, uh, be um, overly concerned about what we're seeing on college campuses while at the same time taking very seriously um, the issues we see on college campuses and trying to engage them. Part of the reason why these are familiar kinds of debates is because tolerating disagreeable opinions is hard. Um, and Americans have always found it hard. So for as long as social scientists have tried to do empirical research um, on public opinion, for example, um, they have surveyed people um, about um, how much they um, uh, agree with uh, the First Amendment, how much do they agree uh, with the idea of free speech, um, how important do they think um, tolerating dissenters and those that they find disagreeable um, actually is. Um, and from the beginnings of doing that kind of survey research in the 1930s and 1940s, um, up until today, um, the uniform response that you get, regardless of what kind of audience you ask, whether it's the mass public or lawyers or college students or the like, um, is overwhelmingly Americans tend to say that they value free speech, they value the First Amendment, they value tolerance, they think all those things are very important. But then if you start pressing them on, well, what about this particular example of speech that you find particularly repellent? Well, then they start trying to carve out exceptions and say, well, free speech is very important, toleration is very important, except for that. That's really not part of what I had in mind by free speech. That um, ought to be um, suppressed. This is an ongoing difficulty, right? It's a challenge of living in a liberal democracy, um, is learning um, that when you value free speech, it means in part that you have to value those um, who you think are going to use that freedom of speech in ways that you find very um, disturbing. Um, and it is the challenge then, even if we recognize what the principles of free speech are, and even if we're reasonably um, correct about those principles and we're fairly firmly committed to them, it's a difficult challenge to actually implement them in practice. 
when we're confronted with individual cases of speech um, that we find uh, particularly um, abhorrent. And so I think it's particularly important then to try to sit back outside the context of individual controversies and try to think about what are our commitments, what principles do we hold, what are the implications of those principles, and that will help us at least to some degree to try to work our way through particular kinds of controversies uh, when they um, arise. And so today I hope to talk a little bit about those kinds of general principles and try to think about how they might apply um, in the context of some, some uh, particular kinds of controversies um, that have arisen um, on college campuses. And I find the university setting an important place, but not a unique place for thinking about these issues. These are important issues as we think about American society uh, more generally. So as we think about um, the president criticizing professional athletes for kneeling um, during um, the playing of the national anthem, they raise similar kinds of issues of how tolerant should we be of dissent? How tolerant should we be of expressions of speech and opinion that we find uh, particularly um, disagreeable? On university campuses, we have some particular reasons for caring about um, that scope of freedom. And part of what I want to try to develop a little bit now um, is why we ought to think about these things as being particularly important in the university context and what changes about the nature of these um, uh, concerns um, as we apply them in universities. Universities are also an interesting context to talk about this because universities, including this one and the one that I teach at Princeton University, are private institutions. They're not public institutions. They're not extensions of the state government, which is oftentimes when we think about free speech and tolerance and the First Amendment, we're thinking precisely about what are the constitutional rules we have to adhere to. What are judges and lawyers going to tell us we have to do? under various kinds of circumstances. And part of what's interesting in thinking about the context of private universities, for example, is there aren't very many judges and lawyers that are gonna be telling us what we have to do in this context. And so what we ought to be thinking about is we as members of a university community, what is it we value and care about and why given those commitments, should we also care about free speech and diversity of opinion and skeptical inquiry? Um, what's inherent about the nature of this kind of community that means that these are important principles that we ought to be trying to value and trying to implement in practice, laying aside the question of what the Constitution might require, uh, what legal rules might require, and the like. And I think it matters in the university context precisely because universities have a very distinctive mission. I characterize that mission as primarily one of the production and dissemination of knowledge. We're trying to expand the scope of human knowledge and trying to communicate what we've learned. Communicate what we've learned to students, to fellow scholars, to the outside world. And critical to that enterprise, that enterprise of trying to expand the scope of human knowledge and try to communicate what we've learned to others is the capacity to engage in free speech. It's critical that we be able to question received wisdom, that we question conventional wisdom, we question what other people take for granted. And we then we try to think very carefully about whether or not what we've taken for granted is in fact true. If it's not true, how it might be modified, what's wrong with it, should it be rejected, or should it be changed in various kinds of ways. And then we try to tell others about what it is we've learned in that. And in that process of telling others about what we've learned, we also will receive skeptical inquiry from them about it. They will challenge us on what we've learned. They will challenge us as to what our conclusions are. And we should be welcoming that um, on a college campus. All that is to say that in the context of a, of a university in particular, we are particularly concerned with trying to press forward to better understand the world. And pressing forward to better understand the world means leaving lots of space open for people to make mistakes, for people to ask hard questions, for people to come to uncomfortable answers in response to those hard questions. And universities lose a lot of their value if they can't engage in that anymore. Daniel Coit Gilman told his board of directors when he was assuming the presidency of the newly established Johns Hopkins University at the tail end of Reconstruction, that the institution we are about to organize would not be worthy of the name of a university if it were to be devoted to any other purpose than the discovery and promulgation of the truth. And it would be ignoble in the extreme of the resources which have been given by the founder without restrictions should be limited to the maintenance of ecclesiastical differences or perverted to the promotion of political strife as the spirit of the university should be that of intellectual freedom and the pursuit of truth and the broadest uh, charity toward those whom we differ in opinion, it is certain that sectarian and partisan preferences should have no control in the selection of teachers and should not be apparent in our official work. That mission, that understanding of a university that Daniel Coy Gilman was trying to articulate uh, in the 19th century has become uh, the central mission of universities across the United States as they moved out of the 19th century and into the 20th century. Old institutions 
shifted their missions to adopt this view of what it is they were all about. New institutions like Johns Hopkins that were being established embraced this mission as what they were trying to move um, forward to do. But at the core of this mission is the belief that they, we should be questioning and pursuing new knowledge and doing the best we can to try to communicate that knowledge um, to others. And that required um, that we have an open space for free inquiry, um, even when uh, what we want to articulate, um, it runs afoul of what other people think um, is terribly um, important. In the book, I try to lay out sort of part of the rationale as to why we think free speech would be particularly important to um, uh, that kind of mission uh, for a university. Um, and I won't detail um, now sort of the various reasons why I think these two things um, are intimately um, connected. I think the key points that I would want you to take away from that is um, that really the only way of gaining true knowledge is to be able to test what we think we know through argument which means we have to be able to embrace um, widespread free speech. We have to be able to embrace robust discussion um, and controversy. If we are going to be able to be confident about what it is we know, if we're going to be able to learn new things and carry them forward. But secondly, also, in the context of controversial speech, um, we should be very skeptical about trusting any potential censure empowered to suppress disfavored speech. So that's a particular lesson that we've learned through the American constitutional experience and legal experience, um, that even if we set up censors with the best possible intentions, hoping that they will make the world a better place by suppressing speech that we find particularly dangerous or particularly disturbing, um, that our repeated experience is that that power is abused. And especially in the context of controversial speech, we will disagree about which kinds of speech ought to be suppressed and which kind of speech ought to be protected. And so as a consequence, we're retreated to a place in which we think we ought to be much more tolerant to speech in general and much more skeptical about the exercise of authority and power to silence those that we um, disagree with because we think in the long run, we'll be better off if we're capable of working through those controversies uh, rather than trying um, to suppress them. And I think with those kind of principles in mind, we're better positioned to think about the controversies as they arise on college campuses, but also off college campuses uh, more, more generally. At the very heart of the university's operations, we should respect the freedom to pursue scholarship and teach uh, with regard only to professional standards and the pursuit of truth and without regard to social and political pressures, where those social and political pressures come from outside the university or from inside the university. This is sometimes characterized as the concept of academic freedom, and it's what academic freedom is centrally concerned with to protect. It's not the freedom to say anything at all that happens to come into our head. It's the freedom to push boundaries of human knowledge and to explore uh, new ideas and to think about them uh, in a serious way. But college campuses are also vibrant intellectual communities in which we debate ideas well beyond the immediate scholarly enterprise of research and teaching. We not only care about academic freedom and what happens in the classroom, what happens in the library, but we're also concerned about public debate and the larger scope of discussion about ideas, not only in a scholarly fashion, but in a more social and political fashion as well. And that's part of what universities um, have increasingly uh, taken on as part of what their mission is and part of why we value universities within American society more more generally. There are places where important matters of public concern can be discussed. And that includes where students can engage with controversial ideas as well as scholars um, and teachers and faculty more generally. And a great deal of, uh, would be lost if colleges were ultimately reduced to nothing but what faculty do uh, with their own uh, research and teaching. We want universities to engage in research and teaching, uh, but we also want universities to be homes of free speech um, as well as simply um, of academic freedom. And courts have increasingly recognized this, often in the context of state universities, where state universities um, in the mid 20th century um, still uh, wanted to try to suppress speech on campus for a variety of reasons, often because it was um, politically um, uncomfortable for those universities to tolerate controversial um, speech on their campus. Sometimes there was concern that it would be uh, embarrassing if alumni or parents got wind of controversial things um, that happened on college campuses. And as a consequence, college administrators um, would often try to shut down those controversial activities on college campuses um, uh, before um, they spread um, too far. Um, and sometimes that resulted in lawsuits in which judges had to remind those state universities of what universities were all about. 
Um, so for example, a federal circuit court in the 1970s um, had to remind the University of Mississippi, which tried to close literary magazine, um, that published what the university president characterized as tasteless and inappropriate language um, in the student literary magazine. And the judges had to remind uh, the university that the historical role of universities um, is to allow people to express opinions which may well not make favor with the majority of society, and that they serve in the vanguard of the fight for freedom of expression and opinion. Um, that sometimes you're in fact are going to get tasteless and immature and inappropriate language in your student literary magazines. Um, but that's part of what you tolerate in order to gain the greater um, good um, that comes with making universities um, robust, um, intellectually interesting uh, places to be. Likewise, universities have struggled over whether or not to recognize student groups, for example, and whether or not to give um, a range of student organizations um, the same kinds of rights and, and capacity as they uh, will recognize in others. And universities have sometimes tried to use that power um, to restrict what kinds of students can organize themselves on campus and what kind of debates um, they can have. Um, and again, it's important to bear in mind that students not only individually um, try to engage um, in arguments and discussions about and ideas that are important to them, but they also organize to engage in those um, uh, discussions. So for example, the Virginia Commonwealth University um, tried to ban the Gay Alliance for Students in the 1970s um, for promoting what its uh, university officials um, characterize as aberrant, even sickening ideas. And the Federal Circuit Court had to point out to those university officials that student associations devoted to advocacy of political, social, legal, and other objectives are part of higher education and useful ultimately for the preparation for later life. Students had to have the capacity to debate ideas that their elders might find very discomforting. And that's part of why universities are valuable. And universities um, should be very cautious before empowering campus officials um, to shut down those debates because those particular campus officials find those debates um, uh, uh, disturbing from their own uh, particular um, perspectives. Over time then, especially from the 60s and 70s, we've become in places where we've become increasingly tolerant of a wide scope for student speech on campus. We recognize student groups um, to be active on campus. We recognize students to be able to organize literary magazines and political magazines and discussions on campus. We recognize the ability of students to bring outside speakers to college campus precisely so they can pursue the ideas that the students find of particular interest. Universities would be much more boring places if the students were forced to only think about the ideas that I find particularly interesting and important. The students have their own ideas about what they find interesting and important and how to explore them in ways that they find particularly accessible and interesting and valuable from their own perspective. And universities are interesting and vibrant places precisely because they've made space not only for me to do what I do, but for you to do what you do, right? And that there are places where people can join together and have those conversations. And ultimately, universities then should be as open as they can be to students and others to be able to have those conversations, including conversations about very difficult um, projects. And part of that activity is likely to be protest activity. And that's also a familiar feature of campus life and has been for many decades on university campuses. And universities should try to make space and room for protest activity as well as other kinds of activities for students to explore ideas and advocate on behalf of ideas. But at the same time, universities have to insist that as students engage in protests, that the form in which their protests are engaged in um, has to recognize the rights of others to also be able to engage in their own activities um, on a college campus. That is to say, willing speakers should be able to communicate to willing audiences um, on a college campus. And members of the campus community should be able to hear ideas that they want. Um, so as a consequence, it's perfectly reasonable to protest those ideas, to complain about those ideas, to have a public conversation about whether or not a given speaker has good ideas or bad ideas, whether or not it was a good idea to invite a given speaker to campus and the like. Um, but disruptions, disinvitations, tearing down signs, throwing out papers, are all efforts to quash the communication of ideas and shut down the free exchange of ideas among students and others um, on the college campus, rather than to advance um, that free exchange of ideas by advancing uh, better ideas in their stead. Students certainly have the right to ignore speech that they find appalling or unpersuasive or take up the challenge of countering that speech with arguments of their own. They need not engage in what they might characterize as debates on subtle topics, but they do not have the privilege to insist that no one else be allowed to treat those questions as unsettled or unresolved. And as a consequence, they don't have the right to insist that others not be allowed to have the debates and pursue the ideas that they think are important um, and worth talking about and thinking about carefully. 
A college campus ultimately cannot claim to be serious about trying to create an environment open to skeptical inquiry and the free-ranging pursuit of the truth if it cannot tolerate the airing of controversial and discomforting um, ideas. Faculty administrators do not have the courage of their convictions if they cannot tolerate having their students hear from speakers that university officials think are obnoxious um, or mistaken. But that also implies a responsibility on those that are trying to make decisions about what kinds of groups to organize on campus, what kinds of events to host on campus, what kinds of speakers to bring to campus. The faculty hired by the university are evaluated by their peers for the quality of their scholarly work and their ability to meet disciplinary expectations about the understanding of their subject. Outside speakers are brought to campus to discuss public affairs and are not necessarily expected to meet those same academic standards. Their contributions to the intellectual community um, are different than the actual intellectual contribution of other faculty, but hopefully their contributions um, are ultimately uh, still real. And as a consequence, if students want to hear from Peter Navarro or Kid Rock or Robert Reich or Michael Moore, university officials should have the courage of their convictions and allow students to hear and evaluate their arguments no matter how badly flawed or morally bankrupt university administrators or faculty might think those arguments actually are. But the goal of bringing in such speakers should be to enlighten and not merely to provoke. Students should want to hear from the best representatives of serious ideas that are worth their time and attention. And no doubt students have a different idea than I do about what is worth their time and attention, but they should take seriously their own responsibilities as members of a campus community to think about how they can help the mission of the university of advancing human knowledge, and, and, but also think about how do we understand uh, our uh, human knowledge better, and not simply how do we simply push boundaries. When we're making decisions about whom to invite the campus to speak, the goal should be neither to stack the deck with our closest allies, nor to sprinkle in the most extreme provocateurs. The goal should be to make available to the campus community at large thoughtful representatives of serious ideas. And as faculty, we have a responsibility to do that, but likewise, students have a responsibility to do that because they have their own authority to engage in debates and discussions on campus, to bring speakers to campus, and they too should take seriously their responsibility to what it is they're trying to accomplish on a college campus and how we can advance our common mission of trying to understand the world better and communicate what it is we know about the world. Embracing free speech is easy. The speech never seems very challenging. It is easy to listen to pleasing ideas and affirmations of our own prior beliefs. It is much more difficult to learn to tolerate those with whom we disagree and who espouse ideas we find preposterous, pregnant, or even dangerous. We should, however, learn not only to tolerate those disagreements, but to seek them out. For it is through controversy and contestation that we can make progress, often in the most unexpected ways. So let me end by noting that universities sometimes struggle to sustain the kind of diverse intellectual communities that would best facilitate the advancement of dissemination um, and knowledge. Um, the liberal philosopher John Stuart Mill, for example, worried that a close society too comfortable in its own convictions would retreat into dogmatism. Despite their own aspirations, universities risk their own retreat into comfortable intellectual bubbles. The university must strive to screen out bad ideas, but it must also strive to bring to campus those who will question and not merely affirm received wisdom. If a community of scholars is not to become lethargic and if the advancement of knowledge is to proceed, scholars cannot become complacent in their studies and blind to their own deficiencies and biases. Universities should be striving to nurture intellectual diversity on their own campuses and when training, hiring, and promoting scholars who make their home on college campuses, universities should demand rigor and professional accomplishment, but also openness to new ideas and a spirit of skepticism and an intellectual curiosity. If universities are to operate on the outer boundaries of our state of knowledge and to push those boundaries further outward, they must be places where new, unorthodox, controversial, and disturbing ideas can be raised and scrutinized. If students are to prepare themselves to critically engage the wide range of perspectives and problems that they will encounter in the world across their lifetimes, they must learn to grapple with and critically examine ideas they find difficult and offensive. For more than a century, universities have been committed to the mission of advancing and disseminating knowledge and recognized the free-ranging exchange of ideas was essential to the realization of that mission. They've often pursued that mission perfectly, and they have sometimes needed to be called to account to better appreciate and to work to realize their own ideals. But recognizing and respecting the principles of free speech is difficult and challenging, and there is no alternative, though, if we are dedicated to the pursuit of truth. And ultimately, the pursuit of truth is the noble, important mission of the modern American university, and I hope it continues to be into the future. So thank you very much.
of time for uh, questions and discussion. Uh, we have a couple microphones. Let me just let you know the microphones are not to amplify your voices in this room, but rather uh, so we can record them uh, for the, the video. Uh, we have a tradition here uh, at the Constitutional Studies Program, which is we always invite our undergraduate students to uh, ask the first question. The undergraduate. And uh, John Henry, maybe take this side of the room, and Nick will. And again, the, the microphones are just for the recording, they won't amplify your voice. Right, right here, definitely, yeah. And tell, stand up, tell us who you are and, and your name as well. Where you are at Notre Dame. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, I can hold it. Uh, hi, thank you so much for your time and energy. Oh, thanks. Give, give your name. Hi, uh, my name is Kendrick Peterson. I'm an undergraduate student here majoring in political science. Um, so I'll tell you my question. Um, marginalized people of color at private institutions oftentimes rely on speech regula uh, regulations to ensure a space where they can thrive and receive an education. Uh, already within the minority, these students are far less to convey their opinions as the space is not conducive um, for them to do so. Do you feel there shouldn't be regulations to protect university retention rates of minority students? Thank you. Uh, so yeah, so certainly I think it's the case that we want to do what we can to retain and attract students in the first place to college campuses. Um, um, and, and so I think the retention issue is potentially separate from, from the specific issue of thinking about how to regulate speech that's conducive to um, uh, keeping students uh, engaged and happy and so well safe um, on, on a college uh, campus more generally. I think my concern here would be twofold. I mean, one is um, um, that I, I'm hesitant to embrace the assumption of the question that um, uh, robust uh, free speech on campus and disagreement controversy um, is necessarily particularly hostile to any particular group on campus. Undoubtedly, people will find particular conversations um, um, unpleasant in, in uh, particular instances. Uh, but more generally, what universities are all about is precisely to bring in um, the widest range of people that are willing to take seriously as, uh, ideas and debate those ideas and to be open to new experiences and new ideas. And universities ought to be as welcoming as they can to anyone that's willing to step onto a campus um, and engage seriously um, in those controversies and ideas. Um, Universities have a responsibility then to um, uh, make students aware of what they're getting into and, and to understand what that mission is and what the project of education um, at the college level um, ought to um, look like. Um, at the other hand, I'm also very cautious and, and concerned, I guess, about um, uh, what the likely unintended consequences are of empowering uh, campus administrators in this case um, to try to regulate um, speech in various kinds of ways. Um, we have lots of experience with empowering officials to regulate speech um, uh, in American society more generally and on college campuses specifically um, across our history. And often that's worked to the detriment of minority students um, on college campuses and minorities uh, within uh, American society uh, more generally. And I don't see any reason to imagine um, that the existence of regulations is likely to work uh, and, and particularly strict and stringent regulations are likely to work more to their advantage um, in the future. Instead, I think campus officials will do what they've always done, um, which is they will try to suppress speech that they find particularly embarrassing um, and that they think might provoke public controversy um, and might um, draw unwanted news attention. Um, and that will um, stretch across a wide range of different kinds of conversations. That will sometimes mean uh, silencing speakers on the right, um, uh, but also it will mean silencing speakers on the left. Um, it will sometimes mean silencing minority speakers, and sometimes it will mean silencing other kinds of speakers. And so I would be extremely reluctant, I think, given our experience, to want to uh, give very much power um, to campus officials to regulate um, the content of speech. Having said that, I think it's important to, to recognize, though, that we do need some regulations about um, uh, how speech is expressed, as well as engagement in universities um, uh, to educate people about engaging in speech as well. So for example, I certainly expect conversations in my classroom to look rather different than I would expect conversations to look like on cable news shows, um, uh, for example. And part of what I hope that we're 
doing on college campuses is helping people understand how do you engage in a conversation about difficult ideas in a way that's productive um, and ultimately helpful um, and, and allows people to think more carefully about those ideas and reach their own conclusions about them. And that certainly does not involve um, shouting at each other, calling each other's names, dismissing each other's ideas and the like. And part of the challenge of a university um, and the kind of education we want to provide is to try to um, uh, help students um, uh, approach those disturbing ideas in ways that are as productive as, as possible. Um, but what happens inside the classroom is not the only thing that happens on college campuses. We also have lots of more reform debate that occurs um, in the public sphere on college campuses um, and quasi-public spheres like um, university dormitories uh, and, and the like. Um, and we want to do what we can as well, I think, to try to help educate students to um, uh, take their responsibilities seriously in that context, while also knowing that a lot of these ideas people care passionately about and they're going to have emotionally charged debates um, in their residence halls as well as in the public square um, uh, of a university. And we want to make space for those emotionally charged um, debates uh, while also insisting that people should not, for example, threaten other people um, on college campuses. They shouldn't harass other people um, uh, on, on the college campuses and the like. And that's sometimes a fine line to walk as to how do you distinguish between um, people having uh, emotionally charged disagreements, um, which is appropriate and reasonable and what you want to have happen on college campuses, and when does that devolve into uh, people harassing each other um, and threatening each other on college campuses, which we certainly don't want um, to do. Um, and you know, I think college administrators have a hard time w walking that line and figuring out which one's which. And, and um, I, you know, I think we should recognize that they're likewise going to make mistakes um, on occasion um, as they try to engage in that process. But ultimately, that should be, that should be the goal. Not quite an undergraduate. I just graduated um, this year. <laughs> You're cheating, uh, man. Cheating. Uh, I'm JP Geshwin. I just graduated from the program of liberal studies. Thank you for being here. Uh, my question concerns John Stuart Mill and uh, the harm principle. And I'm curious about the argument that um, certain kinds of speech is violence. Right. Um, and it, it almost seems like it's an appeal to Mill's harm principle. So I'm curious if that specific uh, line of attack on free speech and then your understanding of the harm principle more generally. Yeah, so I think the harm principle is not the crucial thing I would emphasize in thinking about the free speech context uh, in general, right? I mean, the part of uh, which I discussed some in the book as well, and thinking about Mill and how he's useful in, in thinking about why we want to protect free speech, part of his point is um, that the way in which we're going to advance ideas and better understand ideas is through um, discussion and argument and willingness to take on um, uh, critics. Um, and then separately, uh, in the book on liberty, he wants to talk about the harm principle in terms of other kinds of, of actions and behavior. Um, I think it is true that, th that the harm principle is not completely irrelevant to thinking about um, uh, the speech context, but it's, it's, I wouldn't think it's a central thing either in thinking about um, the speech context. And Mill um, can be helpful, but he's not decisive in thinking about this um, issue in this kind of context um, as, as well. Um, so I think that you're right, that, that there's certainly lots of use on college campuses in particular, but also increasingly off college campuses of the um, uh, linkage between the idea that speech can be violent um, and can be harmful in itself. And, and I, I think my response on that is sort of on, comes at, at, uh, uh, across several points. So um, w one is that there's a sort of theoretical metaphor that that is conceptually embedded in that, that has driven this um, identity between speech and violence, then that metaphor is often very helpful in thinking about um, the ways in which language and speech can be used to um, create and insulate power structures, the way in which it has consequences uh, in the world and the like. I think at the same time, we should be cautious not to um, uh, take too literally what was designed to be a metaphor um, about um, the way speech operates. And so, um, Rather than stopping at the slogan of speech can be um, violent, we want to try to unpack it and try to think about particular instances of speech that we're engaged in and what's, um, and what's behind them, what we're um, being uh, confronted with uh, in particular kinds um, of instances. Um, I think in doing that, one thing we do not want to do is suggest um, that speech is, in fact, never harmful or not harmful. Speech sometimes is harmful. Um, and that is part of the nature of 
engaging in serious debates about serious ideas. There are real consequences attached to that. And, and we don't want to be blind to the fact that there are consequences to that. Um, but the mere fact, I think, in that context, that in fact speech can sometimes be harmful is not itself a reason to want to suppress the speech, right? That, we've been, that that's going to be part and parcel of what public debate over important ideas looks like. Um, and, um, and, and we should be willing to face up to that fact. Right, that we're going to tolerate a certain level of harm in order to gain the greater benefits that come with trying to advance human knowledge and settle our differences through speech rather than through alternative means that we might turn to instead. And so this isn't a context in which we can imagine that the goal is to um, eliminate all harms. That can't be the goal. I don't think we're going to be effective at that goal. Um, uh, but what we do want to try to eliminate is we want to try to eliminate specific threats people are making um, to others and the like. We want to certainly guide speech uh, in a way that's more productive rather than less productive um, so that we can have a free exchange of ideas rather than simply yelling at each other um, and the like. And universities ought to be places where we're trying to teach and nurture people um, to engage in ideas. Um, and arguments in ways that are as productive as possible, that will create as much benefit as possible down the road, and hopefully at least will minimize um, the ways in which speech might be used in a relatively um, harmful way. And we want to do it on college campuses in part because college campuses ought to be important homes for debates over ideas, but in part also college campuses ought to be places where people can learn how to have those conversations and those debates about difficult ideas. Um, before they go out into the world and continue to have those debates and arguments about ideas um, out, into, out into the wider world. Be a shame if students don't, in fact, learn on a college campus how to grapple with um, arguments that they find and ideas that they find particularly disturbing and harmful um, and, and learn how to grapple with them, unpack them, think them through, be persuasive to others um, in this context before they go out into the world and encounter them in other kinds of contexts. Okay. Another question from an undergraduate or both an alumni? A near undergraduate. In the back here. In the back. Hi, I'm Anna Skartz. I'm a junior. And I, a lot of what you're talking about is productive and pushing boundaries. So I wonder what you think of the value or the role of speech that wouldn't necessarily be new ideas, right. um, something that maybe has already been firmly established by science, if like they're contradicting scientific facts, what do you see the role or value of that speech being other than harmful? Uh, I think potentially limited, right? But it depends some on the specific context and depends on, on what we're thinking of. And so, so I think we want to be very cautious about wanting to take things off the table entirely by saying, um, uh, some ideas and controversies are well settled, and we know what the answers are already, and so um, we shouldn't be having these debates anymore. Um, it's for, both, both for two reasons. One is because we may be, in fact be wrong about some of that, right? And so it could well be that we think some issues are settled, but it turns out we made mistakes in how we settled them. People didn't understand them as well as they could. New information can come to light, new arguments and analysis come to light, and we can improve our understanding of those issues um, if we're willing to have those conversations again. Um, so we should be um, careful about trying to um, cabin things off and say um, there's, there's ne necessarily nothing to see here because um, these, these particular ideas are, are well settled and, and, um, and there's nothing new to be offered because often there is something new to be offered um, and we can easily uh, underestimate um, that. Um, at the same time, we want, to, we want to be skeptical of those as well that want to say, I have something new to offer on things that, in fact, we think we're pretty confident about. Um, and uh, because often we have good reason to be confident that we already understand the reasons, right? And so the mere fact that somebody comes to you and says, oh, no, I have something new to say about this idea that you think is very well settled um, doesn't mean they're right. It often means they're wrong, right? And part of what universities ought to be doing as well is trying to help students as well as others, um, distinguish between the bad arguments and the good arguments. Um, and that means universities want to be open to having arguments, um, precisely so we can see the good and the bad arguments. Um, I think university faculty in particular, and the way in which faculty are selected, the way syllabi are constructed, the way we teach in courses, is particularly designed to say that we think that the mechanism by which we're going to get better information and better arguments on the table um, is by filtering them through the lens of expertise. 
right? That we train graduate students, we give them PhDs, we hire people in the world, we promote scholars, um, precisely because um, uh, we think that they are approaching ideas in a particularly helpful way, and they are, in fact, advancing ideas in a fruitful way, and they've demonstrated mastery of a given um, body of knowledge. Um, and it'd be a mistake to think um, that universities should simply embrace people onto the faculty willy-nilly uh, without necessarily paying attention to that kind of expertise. So it's precisely the case that a lot of what academic freedom is concerned is filtering out all that bad information, right? Um, while also recognizing that at the same time we have to be somewhat tentative about all our conclusions, right? We have to at least be open to new kind of claims, but we, but we do want and insist um, that if people are going to challenge those claims that they can do it in a serious uh, way. I think we should be more open um, for the campus more generally, laying aside sort of the particulars of the faculty that we bring to campus, of sort of thinking about what public speakers we might bring to campus, for example. That's more acceptable to bring people that we might think of as cranks to campus, right? Who are um, trying to argue about ideas. So the faculty, for example, are highly convinced are bad and dubious ideas. And they've been disproved many times over. In part, that's useful because students need to see those ideas, right? And see them discuss in debates. And students need to be able to understand why, in fact, they're bad. And faculty ought to be confident enough that they, that in their own understandings, that they can help students through, through that process. At the same time, we shouldn't be going out and looking for every crank that we possibly can find to bring to campus, right? We, that even, for example, student groups that are empowered to bring outside speakers to campus ought to be thinking seriously before they bring somebody to campus, what's going to be gained? by bringing this person to campus? Is this person a representative of a serious set of ideas that they can articulate in a serious way that might actually matter? They may be ideas that are well outside the mainstream. They might, for example, be socialists, among other things. Right? And, and we might think, no, no, those are ideas worth thinking about. Right? Even if the faculty is convinced those ideas are, in fact, very bad, and we've had these debates before, and we've settled them. Right? And nonetheless, we might say, no, no, these are worth having conversations about. Um, but, and, and we're going to make mistakes on that, right? Because sometimes we're going to bring people to campus because precisely because we're open to saying we ought to have ideas debated on this campus that are outside the mainstream, precisely because of that, we're going to sometimes bring people to campus that are kooks, right? And they're going to be making arguments that are outside the mainstream and in fact are not very good arguments. And in hindsight, we might look at that and say, well, that was sort of a mistake. We didn't learn anything as a consequence of that. That was not a productive exchange of ideas, right? But we should be open to making those mistakes because ultimately it's more beneficial to be open to occasionally making those mistakes precisely because we're going to get benefits from asking hard questions and difficult ideas and ideas that sometimes people aren't taking seriously in other places, right? And that we want to be taking seriously on a college campus, right? And so if occasionally that means we're going to get somebody coming to campus and or talk about the, um, the reality of Bigfoot, right? It also means we're occasionally going to get people coming to campus who are talking about ideas that are really important and are not being talked about on the cable news shows in ways they should. They haven't yet claimed um, space uh, in the public landscape more generally. And colleges ought to be places where we can nurture ide those ideas, explore them, think them through. Um, and if they uh, seem sufficiently uh, deserving, can ultimately gain an audience and progress. Right? Um, so I think it is intrinsic to the nature of our enterprise. Um, that we want to be open to new ideas. And, and the result is we're often going to encounter lots of bad ideas. Um, but that we ought to be tolerant of encountering bad ideas um, because that's the only way forward. Uh, right here. Does it, what, we, what you just said, does that mean the Ivy League professor Crank is the ideal speaker? <laughs> that's exactly right. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I think, it, but I think universities ought to also take seriously on this front, right? That if they have a person on the faculty who, in fact, becomes a crank because they're not professionally responsible within their own area of expertise, and they're no longer um, adhering to um, things the community would regard as appropriate scholarly standards. Universities, in fact, should probably try to exclude those people from the classroom, maybe remove them from campus entirely, right? So part of our commitment, if we think that, that um, the, the academic freedom is precisely by, about protecting people to engage in serious scholarly inquiry. We also have to hold people accountable if they're misusing their, their, um, respons their um, obligations in the classroom, um, if they're uh, not producing um, a viable um, scholarship. And universities should sometimes um, uh, try to pare back on the cranks on, on their own faculty. And sometimes those exist. Yeah. I'm sorry? At least you're not from Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. 
Uh, I'm George Alsankri. I'm a junior. I study computer engineering, so I might not know what I'm talking about. Um, so my question is, um, which might be out of scope, but um, right. what about religious universities that have like mission statements? Like, I know schools like Calvin and Meaton. Right. Like, you have to sign a statement that I, I, I have to express Calvinist ideals when I teach and like send my kids to Calvinist schools sure. or not. So like these universities with like mission statements that are that have like the main idea of like disseminating re religion right. or religious idea, like how responsible would they be of inviting even hiring faculties because it's their money? Um, like how like what are the limitations? Like how should they do it? Right? Like yeah. you know it's sometimes you know what if you some what if you invite someone who's like actively against the religion you preach like as a faculty like is that right are they in the right to say no because they disagree with us like you know like secular universities are very easy to define you know like this is fine but religious universities it's it gets a lot more money yeah no i think it does get money and, and there are difficult questions on that front um so so ultimately i'm a pluralist in this regard that i'm happy to see a thousand flowers bloom and for there to be lots of different institutions of higher education out there that take um their mission they have particular missions that are slightly different than others and they're making their own choices about how to pursue those missions um in some in some cases that might mean religious universities that want to say look some things are off the table because we take as a matter of faith for those of us who are members of this particular community that there are some questions we're going to, some answers we're going to take for granted. And we don't want skeptical inquiry on those questions here, but we're willing to explore lots of other stuff. Um, I think that's compromised, right? It's a limitation. It'd be extraordinarily uh, damaging to society if all institutions um, look like that. But if a particular institution wanted to be like that and was transparent about what it was being and would invite uh, members to be uh, people to become members of that community on the understanding that this is the set of restrictions we have here, I think that's a reasonable set of choices to make. And then the question is, well, how well is it working in practice? And then there are really tough decisions to be made within that context, right? So if, you've, um, uh, try, if you're trying to construct that kind of community, there are hard questions to be made about how, well, how do you balance exactly between our desire to be skeptical and think about other kinds of questions uh, in a serious way while also trying to keep some uh, things um, off the table because we're particularly firmly committed to them. And I think that can exist both in the religious context, but it also exists in a secular context as well, for example. So Middlebury College, uh, for example, um, that is now infamous primarily for shouting down Charles Murray uh, when he came to give a talk there. If Middlebury College uh, wanted to explicitly say some ideas are off the table, and our community is dedicated to a set of uh, principled commitments, and everyone who comes here ought to understand that and understand what they've signed on for. Um, and we're not going to tolerate um, people coming to campus to question those ideas. We're not going to tolerate uh, teachers in the classroom um, asking uh, questions about those ideas. Um, I'd be much more comfortable with that if Middlebury was straightforward about it and said when they were hiring faculty and, and recruiting students that, in fact, you should recognize that we're a kind of restrictive community here. There are some intellectual issues um, that we don't want to debate. Um, and I think religious universities are in the same boat um, in having to make uh, choices about that. Um, but from my perspective, I think those are always going to be somewhat compromised from the perspective of this larger commitment of, inst of institutions of higher education to be truth-seeking institutions, because you basically have said, on this topic, we think we already know the truth and we're not open to skepticism for people to challenge it, right? So it's the extreme version of this question of, look, those are settled debates. And, right, and, and they're so settled, we don't even want to talk about it, right? Except to convey to you what we think the settlement was, right? Um, and you know, I think that there, there may be reasons to try to organize a community that way, um, but you definitely lose something in that process. But you, know, you gain some things too, and I think it's reasonable for, for institutions to potentially want to experiment with that. Questions from, from anyone? Hi, my name is uh, Will Jones. I'm in the program of liberal studies at uh, Notre Dame. Uh, my question is that uh, a lot of your arguments sort of predicated on the idea that um, the goal of the university is to seek out truth, right? And free speech is, is a great tool for that. It allows us to engage in ideas and help us figure out what is true. Uh, what would you say to people who uh, perhaps uh, reject the idea that there is uh, a truth to be sought out and uh, who subscribe to the idea that uh, 
if you disagree with me, that's your opinion, but don't uh, uh, pressure my beliefs with your ideas. Yeah, I think in the extreme form, that becomes very hard. Um, uh, and it's hard to even see uh, how, how it makes sense to um, uh, integrate that into a campus, let alone integrate a campus onto that kind of foundation um, of thinking. Um, that there's, there's no truth to be found. All there are is a will to power, and we're just going to express that. Um, man, I get how people find themselves um, believing that, but it's very hard to imagine how you construct a university with that um, as, as a central understanding of itself, or a campus community with that as a central understanding um, of itself. I think, though, in practice, very few people actually look like that, right? Um, so even, even those who want to construct elaborate theoretical um, uh, structures to support something that look like that, nonetheless have um, lots of outs where they instead say, well, look, I don't believe in truth with a capital T, but there's nonetheless going to be all kinds of arguments that I think are making advances where we can take, where we in fact can make progress on better understanding something. And it's all contingent and it's relative and it's not, maybe not get us ever um, to a final truth. But nonetheless, there are things we can talk about, right? Things we can make progress on, things that are worth exploring and trying to understand better. Um, and it's not simply um, all just a power play. Um, and, and so in that sense, I think it's easy to wrap those people back in again, right? And, and to say, well, look, I, you don't need a commitment to the truth as a capital T to recognize that the goal of a community like this that, that's committed to um, education and, and uh, the advancement of knowledge and communication of ideas um, is not the idea that there's an the ultimate goal where we're going to get the truth with capital T necessarily. You could be committed to that, but you don't necessarily have to be committed to that. You could just simply think that we can understand the world better if we're, if we're capable of exploring it and capable of hearing arguments about it, and capable of evaluating evidence about it. We can understand humans better if we do that. Um, and we ought to be open to those ideas and arguments and evidence um, as, as well um, and, see, and see where it gets us. Um, so I, I tend to think when push comes to shove, there are very many people that would actually be sort of on that such extreme that they would um, uh, not be capable of being worked into that kind of uh, framework and, and understanding. Plus a couple. So I want to distinguish two themes in John Stuart Mill, uh, and uh, I, I heard you emphasize one, but there is another one that seems to creep in unofficially. That, right. uh, so one is the idea that we want to be open to multiple ideas because we could be wrong. Right. And so we let in other ideas because we think that perhaps those ideas have a measure of truth. Right. With respect to some of the most controversial ideas, you just can't say that with a straight face. So we say, we want the Nazis speaking yes. on campus because we actually think that there's an argument to be made for genocide, and it could be that we're all wrong about genocide, and maybe genocide is a really good thing. Right. I just can't say that. I can't right. believe that. It's just not, I, it, it's not a serious argument for free speech. Yeah. There's another argument, which is really based more on character, and I think it comes out more clearly in chapter three than chapter two of On Liberty, that uh, it's important for people to actually vividly understand why they believe what they believe, and they develop that by encountering really awful ideas and learning how to articulate how to respond to them, you know, and you, even stipulating that those ideas are completely wrong. And if you're going to talk about uh, particularly the education of undergraduates who are not actively involved in the production of knowledge, right. uh, they're there to acquire skills, including skills of encountering ideas, that seems to me to be a stronger argument for free speech. Uh, yeah, particularly you know, the most controversial cases we've got, right. you know, racists and Nazis. Uh, yeah, moral skepticism just doesn't seem to me to be a particular or skepticism about truth uh, and openness to their ideas just doesn't seem to be uh, either the most powerful rhetorical move or substantively sound. No, I think that's right. Although I think also I, I, I'm reluctant to think the second move actually works much better from that context either, actually. So I don't think either one uh, gets me where you'd want to go in that framework. Because I think you're fundamentally right, right? You, you can identify examples of things um, 
Nazis or Bigfoot believers, either way, who um, uh, are committed to a set of ideas that um, we think um, it's extraordinarily unlikely that they're right and that they could persuade us that they um, are, in fact, right. Um, and so um, there's little to be gained by bringing them in or to have that conversation on the idea, well, maybe we're just wrong and we'll all convert into being Nazis um, uh, after, we have that, um, after we have that conversation. Um, and, I, and I think that the second point you made is, is sort of push in this direction, although it's not quite the way I'd frame it, because I think actually we, we sometimes underestimate the power of having those conversations, because we think that the reason why we have them is, is, the, is holding out the possibility we might convert, right? The, the possibility that maybe the Nazi was right all along, um, and only if we heard them out, they, they would persuade us. Um, and I think instead the argument is not only sort of your argument about we ought to see what the moves are so we know um, uh, how to respond to them, but I think more generally, it's also true that the Nazi may be, in fact, completely wrong and not persuade us um, that we ought to become Nazis. Um, and yet the Nazi may push on our own beliefs such that we realize we need to think more carefully about what our actual commitments are. And so we walk away from those conversations um, not having converted, but we walk away nonetheless better off because we understand where the weaknesses of our own commitments are and, and where we need to think more carefully about them in order to better shore them up. And so it's by encountering those arguments um, that we may improve our own commitments rather than necessarily thinking about I have to hold myself open in case I'm going to um, flip to the, to the other side. Um, I don't think that's what you have to be committed to is that openness to flipping to the other side in order to recognize that there nonetheless could be intellectual gains by having conversations. Having said that, I think the concern about Nazis in particular is that those conversations are, even, are only going to be useful even from that perspective um, if those are productive and interesting interlocutors, right? And, and often having conversations with Nazis is not the best way of trying to understand your own ideas better. And one of the reasons why I find myself disturbed by people intent on inviting people like that to college campuses is because that's not a necessarily a useful conversation to have. It's not particularly productive. And it's not just because we already know that the Nazis are wrong, um, but it's also because we're not going to get a useful exchange of ideas out of that such that we can have a better understanding of anything in particular. Um, nor is it the case that those are important ideas represented out in broader society knock on wood, right? Such that we really need to understand them before we go out into the world. And so if we're going to be a good, engaged citizen, we really got to understand the Nazi argument so we know what all the moves are, um, because we're likely to encounter lots of Nazis out in the world that we have to be able to engage with. And I just don't think that's true, right? And so as a consequence, we ought to be selective and careful and, and choosy about who is it worth engaging with and having conversations with, um, either in the sense of this might be productive conversations to have, um, or in the sense of um, these are serious positions out in the world and we better understand them. Because if we don't understand them, uh, we're not going to be well equipped to operate uh, in society uh, more, more generally. Um, but, but that standard does require then they have to meet some threshold of they are serious enough ideas out in the world that it's worth it, our time to engage them um, such that we can understand them better um, and can um, uh, engage them better down the road. The other thing I would say about this, though, that's, that is relevant in college context, also relevant in other contexts, is, is um, a separate concern. So, right, so that, both those kind of arguments emphasize the ways in which having those conversations can be useful for pursuing the truth better. Right? Um, but the other concern is, is just one of skepticism about power, right? So if we empower somebody saying, um, uh, I'm going to empower the dean of student life, um, and so the dean of student life hopefully will use that power to exclude the Nazis, um, I'm going to be really nervous they're going to exclude a lot more than the Nazis. Um, and I think that's been our experience, right? And so I'm very cautious about wanting to empower the dean of student life to exercise that. that power because they may sometimes exclude the Nazis, but they're going to exclude a lot more. Um, and I'm sufficiently distrustful of that, that I'd rather um, be open to the possibility that somebody might want to invite a Nazi, and then we can have a conversation about why that's a bad idea, um, than I am empowering some campus administrator to simply um, uh, exercise power to prevent that from happening. Professor okay. Hall. Thank you again for your uh, very interesting talk. I, I'm interested, you've spoken a lot about the responsibility incumbent on administrators, faculty, and students to uh, when selecting speakers to invite to campus. Right. But 
at any given time, there's a very small number of people invited to campus compared to the legions not being invited to campus. None of that tends to spark controversy. What it seems to me most often sparks controversy is the disinvitation. The invitation is extended to the speaker, and then usually right. one of two things right. happens. Either the invitation sparks far more controversy than the inviter expected, or information about the speaker comes to light. Oh, the speaker has advocated these horrible things we didn't know, which then either right. one of those two things prompts the disinvitation. So I'm curious about is there a different set of responsibilities once an invitation has been extended? Hmm. Does it matter which of those two prompted the disinvitation? For instance, I could imagine you saying, well, if it's just criticism of those ideas, that's different than, no, we learned something new about the speaker. We never would have invited them if we had known this information in the first place. Right. And then to add even more complexity to the question, is the answer different if it's the administrator, a faculty member, or a student group doing the inviting and the disinviting? Um, so it's an interesting question whether it matters from that perspective, whether if they're doing the inviting and the disinviting. I mean, I think you're right that the, that the, the, the attention is all focused on who you actually have extended invitations to, and then sometimes that subset that we're disinviting. Um, and, and the thing that is, is always is true, the non-action is harder to evaluate, which is all the cases of people we could have invited but didn't invite. And so I think my larger concern um, is, is, is in some ways that, that I don't want to, it's important to have conversations about these particular instances of should this speaker have been invited, should that speaker have been disinvited, et cetera. I think the larger, more important conversation to be having is how do we create um, a, a complex, robust intellectual environment on campuses um, such that a wide range of people can be brought to campuses. And, and one way of doing that is by empowering lots of different kinds of groups on college campuses. So one thing that have made universities more vibrant places, I think, is precisely by saying, we're not just going to have the Department of Political Science making all the decisions about what kinds of political speakers can come to campus. We're not just going to have a committee um, organized out of the president's office making decisions about what speakers can <laughs> come to campus. We're going to empower students to make decisions about who they want to bring to campus also. And they, too, will be able to bring, and we're going to make it easy for students to form groups to be able to bring speakers to campus. And the consequence of that, ultimately, I think, is you're going to have a more pluralistic, diverse, robust set of conversations. Lots of mistakes will get made in that process. Um, but that's ultimately a better process for sort of generating new ideas. And undoubtedly, things are getting overlooked, and interesting people aren't being invited, um, as well as, as people who are not very interesting are being invited. Um, but, um, but, that, but we should focus on the ecosystem and how we maintain it. Um, and, and that's critically important, much more important in some ways than these individual conflicts over disinvitations, um, for example. I do think the disinvitation thing, though, is troubling in part because it affects that ecosystem, right? So the ways in which the disinvitation process often plays out is I've empowered you, a student group, to bring people to campus precisely because you should have the freedom to invite people that you find interesting and fit with your ideas to campus. But when you invite somebody I don't like, I'm now going to quash you, right? And, and force you to disinvite that person, right? Well, then you've lost what the whole point was, which is the capacity of different people on campus to bring things that they find interesting um, to campus uh, in general. So I think it's perfectly reasonable, although very hard to tell the difference in practice and maintain it in practice, but it's perfectly reasonable to criticize people and say, well, that was really dumb. You shouldn't have brought that person to campus. That was a bad person to bring. Um, and, and we're not going to gain anything by it, and you shouldn't do it again, and all that kind of stuff. But that's different than exercising power and saying, now you must disinvite, or I'm going to step in and disinvite that person for you. Um, by removing your authority um, to be able to extend the invitation. So I tend to think that once the invitations have been extended, um, that, that we should almost always honor them and, and bring the person to campus at the end of the day, both because we're, we ought to worry about that um, ecosystem and how we sustain it um, over time, but also because I think it sends a very troubling message about the nature of the university if we say, well, that speaker turns out um, is somebody we just can't tolerate talking to. Um, and, and that shouldn't be the message that we're trying to extend, right? So much better to instead engage with that speaker, criticize that speaker, protest that speaker, rather than saying, we can't, we got to plug our ears and not even hear that speaker at the end of the day. Okay, a uh, couple more questions. I'm actually going to take the, the moderator's prerogative and uh, ask a question, ask you to uh, maybe elaborate on something. Which is You'll need the mic for posterity. Uh -huh. 
elaborate on something that's been uh, maybe implicit in your comments. Let's see if you can make it uh, more explicit. Um, one here's the argument that uh, certain types of inquiry or a certain type of speaker or speaker with certain views, uh, the mere presence of that inquiry or that speaker on campus right. is an affront to my dignity. Right. Uh, that, uh, you know, you're, you're assaulting me in the very nature of the subject matter, the right. speaker. The, uh, what's your response to that, that sort of dignitary harm argument? So, so my hope is that, that, that it should be the case that when you come to college campus, you will, um, there will almost necessarily be other people on the college campus that you will have profound disagreements with. Um, and that that's what you should expect out of the college experience. Um, and then the question is, how do we take those profound disagreements and make them as interesting and productive as possible um, uh, so that we can uh, work through them? Um, and then instead, the reaction is to say, I've encountered somebody I profoundly disagree with, um, and as a consequence, I'm harmed by that encounter. Um, then um, they're not getting what we ought to be getting out of the, out of the college experience. I think part of that, though, is it's, is it's critically important then to be able to emphasize that as institutions, we are committed to that free exchange of ideas and that diverse population of people exchanging those ideas, right? And so you may find people who have particular substantive ideas that you disagree with. You may find people who, among their substantive particular ideas um, that you disagree with, is a view, for example, that you shouldn't be on that college campus, right? But, but, but the underlying commitment is nonetheless that we've constructed a campus in which all those people are welcome and capable of having that conversation, um, including conversations about who we ought to exclude in the future, um, right? And that can run the gamut about all kinds of things, right? Um, so in that sense, I, I think that it's important for institutions to articulate what their core commitments are, and their core commitments include not only a free exchange of ideas, but, uh, but um, being inclusive to a diverse population of, of students and faculty who come um, to that campus um, in order to have that free exchange um, of ideas. Um, and we want to be able to lead students to not be surprised then when they encounter people that they are going to have profound disagreements with and recognize that those profound disagreements are sort of part of the process. Um, and, part, and, and sometimes those can be extraordinarily unsettling. Um, and that that's also part of the process. Um, and so I think part, part of our difficulty now as universities within modern American society is we have um, uh, backed ourselves into a weak position because we've tried to position universities as if they're just an elaborate Starbucks. Um, and and that, uh, what we're trying to do is create very comfortable environments for people to come. And we've got great dorms and gyms and um, uh, coffee shops um, on the campus. Um, and we haven't emphasized it enough. And, and at the end of that, we'll give you a piece of paper and maybe you'll get a better job as a consequence, right? And, and the, but we haven't emphasized enough to people coming into campuses about what we actually do here, which is not serve coffee. The thing that we do here is engage with difficult ideas, and that that's what you ought to expect to encounter. And so way back in the back of my mind when I first started thinking about this issue, or, or, and I realized that when I sat down to write, this is sort of where I started thinking about a lot of these ideas and, and, and concerns, is actually not too long after 9-11, in which the University of North Carolina um, adopted for their summer reading, because they assigned for all the incoming freshmen a common uh, reading um, uh, book uh, for them to read. Um, and not too long after 9-11, the book they assigned was a book about the Quran and commentaries on the Quran. And a set of Christian students objected that I shouldn't have to be exposed to a book uh, about the Quran when I go to college at the University of North Carolina. And my immediate reaction was to think, these people don't understand what they're doing and why they're going to college and what they should be expecting to go to college, right? And, and because the articulated claim was precisely of, I shouldn't have to encounter things as a student going to university um, that will challenge my basic commitments and beliefs. I shouldn't have to encounter ideas that I find distasteful and disturbing or contrary um, to my prior commitments. And that's not what college is. And these people have been, and those students who were coming into the University of North Carolina at that time, as well as students subsequently who objected to other books that they've been assigned in summer readings, Part of the difficulty is that they, it, that they were, had a wrong set of expectations, that universities had helped create that wrong set of expectations about what they should be encountering. Um, and the students should come in knowing. Right? They're going to encounter a wide range of people. Some of those people um, are going to be annoying. Some of those people are going to have really bad ideas. Um, and some of those people are going to th th think about things in ways that are extraordinarily disagreeable um, uh, from your perspective. Um, and nonetheless, 
universities are interesting and lively places, in part because those people exist. And that doesn't mean you got to spend all your time talking to them, but, but they exist, and, and, and you want them to exist to some degree. Let's give uh, Professor Vermeule. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Vermeule, uh, now Professor of Law from Harvard. Hi, uh, thanks, Keith. Uh, wonderful stuff, and makes a lot of sense to me on on a number of levels. But um, I do have the following sort of question: I worry that the whole topic of free speech and free speech policies is slightly a second decimal topic in a world in which um, university constituents, especially faculty, display so little intellectual diversity. Yes, I'll explain why that is. First, first of all, the um, the set of principles you lay laid out has a number of kind of sp rather spongy override conditions. What counts as a serious idea? What counts as a truly settled idea, as opposed to a potentially false idea or something like that? Right. In a world in which a hundred percent or nearly a hundred percent of faculty um, subscribe to a very particular and, and very extreme set of views, those override conditions will be seen and applied in certain ways. They may, in all the best of faith, think they're following your principles, but just simply dismissing is not serious anything right. outside this very circumscribed set. So that's, um, that's one problem. And the other problem is that the main issue isn't so much formal university policies of invitation, disinvitation. The main issue on campuses, it seems to me, is informal social sanctions, norms, expectations applied uh, partly from faculty to students, partly from students to each other. Um, that creates this, uh, on many campuses, a completely stifling atmosphere, even though nominal free speech policies are perfectly in line with what you suggest. So those two problems suggest that the, 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 the formal policies aren't, aren't really the problem. The problem are the lack of diversity among the people and the kind of system of web of social norms and sanctions. Yeah, I think both those things are totally true. And so um, uh, my hope is that... Um, uh, exploring that one that the foundations for thinking about questions like uh, should you disinvite speakers, should you shout down speakers, etc. The thinking through those foundations will also lead you to a place that can help you think through should you have more intellectual diversity on your college campuses uh, and and the like as well. And so it'll be helpful in thinking about those issues. I, and, and, and I try to include some of that um, in, in the book as well, precisely because I want to say to my friends on the left, if you're very concerned about um, people outside of universities complaining when um, uh, professors um, say controversial things on Twitter, um, that, that you also ought to look internally about, well, how diverse is your own institution in terms of the range of ideas that you tolerate on your college campus. And maybe you could do a better job of living up to those ideas, just like those on out, who are outside college campuses complaining about them can do a better job of living up to some of those um, ideas um, as well. And But I think it's also true that, um, as you suggest, this the, pro the problem of um, culture and um, uh, shunning and, and ostracism often among peers um, on college campuses um, is a very difficult problem to solve. Um, and uh, and it's, 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 it's a much easier problem to sort of say, okay, let's get the regulations right about um, how we deal with outside speakers and let's um, get the system of sanctions right about how we deal with people who violate um, those rules. It's a much harder challenge to say, um, come into the classroom and say something that your fellow students are going to regard as controversial. Um, uh, that's a tough uh, thing to change, and, and I think partially um, that process of change is going to be, have to be a gradual one, partially it's going to be one of trying to change what the culture is, and partially I think it's the one of trying to introduce a wider range of ideas into the college environment so that students can see, in part, one, a wide range of ideas are actually tolerated here, and you can have those conversations, and they're difficult, and everyone can walk away and still be okay with each other, despite the fact they have these fundamental disagreements. Um, and two, also recognize that part of what's going to happen is people are going to make mistakes. Um, the people are going to try, are going to try ideas um, that are, are sometimes going to be deeply flawed, and that um, that doesn't mean they're an evil person. It means that that's learning, um, and that we need to encourage students to be able to take risks um, and tolerate the fact that other students are simultaneously taking risks um, as well. Um, but I worry very much um, about um, 
how you deal with that. And, and I particularly worry about it um, in smaller institutions um, like Princeton, uh, for example. So one thing that I, so I was an undergraduate at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, one of the attractions I found about a big university like that um, is that my fellow students are mostly anonymous, right? You walk into a classroom, you say whatever you say, you walk out, you never see those people again. Right? Um, and, and there's some downsides of that that I recognize, but the upside of that is it does give you a layer of protection, right? The, the, it's a, in a population of 50,000 students, you can find some fellow like-minded students. Um, and you can be in the minority, a distinct minority, and, and not worry that I'm going to completely um, lose all my social connections and nobody's going to invite me to a party because everybody else is like-minded and there's only 3,000 of us um, on this campus. Um, so, so I worry a lot about these smaller institutions like these small liberal arts colleges, for example, that wind up creating very homogeneous environments in which it's much tougher then for anyone to stick their neck out um, and express disagreement. And I think we'd be much better off if we try to construct environments in which um, people coming in from a pretty wide range of perspectives and views. Um, and then as a consequence, people will see that you're going to naturally encounter that diversity and it's okay to have disagreements. Um, and yet we can still learn to live together and get along reasonably well. Two announcements before we thank our speaker. Uh, two weeks from today, on Thursday, uh, September 13th, we're bringing uh, a very distinguished, uh, an another pr Princeton political scientist, Dr. Robert George, who will be giving uh, our Tocqueville lecture on uh, citizenship and the Constitution. That's two weeks from today. You're all invited to his lecture, which will be at 3.30 PM uh, here in the same building. Uh, uh, Professor Whittington, the bookstore has uh, brought some copies of Professor Whittington's new book on free speech out. He'll be at the table there signing books, uh, available for more conversation. Uh, thank you for coming, and please join me in thanking uh, our speaker. Thank you very much.